Namaskar. Good evening, everyone. I welcome you all to the concluding session of the Dattopan Tengdi lecture series under the aegis of Akhil Bharti Adivakta Parishad. You can watch us live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. I am joined today by Shri K. Srinivas Murthy, Working President, Akhil Bharti Adivakta Parishad, Shri Nachiketa Joshi, General Secretary, Supreme Court Unit of the Adivakta Parishad, and our guest speaker for the day, Shri Harish Chalve, Queen's Counsel and Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India. I welcome you all, sir. We will start today's program with a welcome address by Shri K. Srinivas Murthy, Working President of the Akhil Bharti Adivakta Parishad. Over to you, sir. Namaskar. Good evening. On behalf of Hajivakta Parishad, I hope and trust that all of you are staying at home and safe while taking care of elders, children in our parivar. Hajivakta Parishad has always felt that the advocates, especially the lawyers with social commitment, expand their vision and enhance the skills. Taking this forward, our young talented team has visualized this lecture series which has helped all of us to sharpen our focus. The speakers in this series have given their knowledge which they had acquired through their years of hard work, challenges and of course success. They had opened new windows to all of us. Alifakta Parishad is grateful to every one of them for sparing time, energy for this series. This lecture series has been launched during the centenary celebrations of Sri Dattopan Tengdiji, the author of the famous book Third Way. He, has, he was a member of Raj Sabha for 12 years and dedicated his life to the mission of national reconstruction. He founded and molded the largest trade union, Bharti Mazdur Sangh, BMS. He mentored Swadeshi Jaganamanch and Bharti Kisan Sangh. In 1992, he gave an inspiring lecture at a function wherein Adhivakta Parishad was formally launched and came into existence. With his inspirational guidance, the Adhivakta Parishad has been working to supplement the Sajjana Shakti. As Tengdiji wished, the Advakta Parishad has been striving to train the young advocates to be good lawyers with social commitment so that justice delivery system is strengthened in this democratic system. Seminars, study circles, workshops have been conducted all over the country. The present lecture series is one such effort. Today, the final lecture is to be delivered by Sri Haresh Shalveji who needs no introduction. From next week onwards, we will be launching another series by name and style, Madhav Meenan Memorial Lecture Series. Before ending, I would say that I request all the advocates to download Aragya Setu and see that at least 100 persons download this Aragya Setu and at least 100 more persons Donate to the PM's care fund. Over to you, Ajwendra. Thank you so much, Thank sir. You for so your much, sir. Friends, in the last two weeks, we have seen some of the prominent jurists of our country speak with us and enlighten us on different aspects of law and advocacy. As they say, save the best for the last, and so we also did. It is a great pleasure and a true honor for me to introduce to you our esteemed speaker for today, who has been immensely gracious to share with us his valuable time and insight through the Dattopan Tengri lecture series. It is also a very difficult task. How do I introduce a man who needs no introduction? He's one of the well-respected and sought after legal minds in India, known for his sharp intellect, outstanding oratory skills, and impeccable court craft. He is very well known in the legal circle for his innate ability to simplify the most complicated issues at hand, to identify the very core of the dispute and offer innovative solutions and arguments showcasing outstanding brilliance. It is no surprise that the biggest corporate houses, famed Bollywood stars, as well as deserving but ill-fortune complainants 
all think of him when faced with a legal quandary. From Minerva Mills, which most of us junior lawyers have studied during our law school years, or the far recent multi billion dollar board up on dispute, our speaker has been instrumental in bringing about several significant developments in our legal jurisprudence through path breaking cases. Not only has he ensured time and again that justice is done, but that is that it is done well. Senior advocate, former Solicitor General, Queen's Counsel, to being the hope of every Indian, rallying behind Kulbushan Jadav. He has done it all. Truly, he is the second Kohinoor of India who, like the previous one, can also be found in London on most days. He is amongst us today to speak about his experience defending the country in the widely reported Kulbushan Jadav case at the International Court of Justice, in which he ensured that a rogue nation is compelled to practice due process of law. Despite the immense public scrutiny and associated pressures, our speaker stood out as the more dignified, intellectually superior and balanced counsel as against his opposition. The fact that he did it all by charging a token fee of one Indian rupee for his services showcased to the world his devotion despite personal cost. Please welcome live from London, the crowning jewel of the legal field, Mr. Harish Salve. Good Harish evening. Sir. Good evening or good afternoon from London. I am so honored to be asked to speak on this platform. And uh, the platform itself carries so much uh, weight, it carries so much tradition. Dattopan Thengadi was an extraordinary, what, what we can call a, a visionary extraordinaire, a man of extraordinary vision, born in the early 20th century at a time where India was in the first throes of trying to set up a structure for seeking freedoms from the rule. Living through that, seeing modern India come into place, working always for those who did not have a voice, the working class. He was the founder of the Bharati Kisan uh, and the Mazdoor unions. A man for whom it can truly be said that he had a mind of platinum and a heart of gold. And it's therefore a big honor for me to be invited to speak in lectures which are in his memory. And in one sense, when uh, Ardendo asked me to choose the topics, I thought of this because Dato Panji was a fierce nationalist and who always put pride of his country ahead of everything else in life. And therefore, I thought speaking about the Kolbushan Jadav case would be something which would be appropriate. Because as I will explain, as I tell you what the case was about, somewhere along this entire process, it also reflected the new respect which the global community has for India and the place which India today has come to occupy amongst nations in the global arena. The International Court of Justice, let me tell you first a little bit about the International Court of Justice. It was formed, as you know, at the time of the League of Nations. It predated the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council was put in place and after which there was a formal court which was created, which took over from its predecessor. And that's what we now call the International Court of Justice. It is, it by its constitution has 15 judges and they are elected by countries, turn by turn, by an electorate, countries nominate and then they get elected. They have a very interesting feature in the ICJ 
if there is a dispute between two countries, well, invariably there would be, it could be two or more. But if there's a dispute between two countries, then if the country does not already have a judge of its nationality on the court, the country gets a chance to appoint a judge to the ICJ. So they try to ensure that there's at least one judge of the nationality of the litigant country on the bench. It may seem a little counterintuitive to lawyers. We, we as lawyers always think in terms of conflict of interest and always think in terms of a judge not sitting in a dispute where he has any personal interest or his country would be involved. But the ICJ being more like an international institution rather than a ordinary municipal court, it has this rule that you must have at least one judge from the litigating countries each of the litigating countries on the bench. The ICJ has three kinds of jurisdiction broadly. One is what is called their compulsory jurisdiction. Compulsory jurisdiction means if a country declares that it accedes to the jurisdiction of the ICJ, then that becomes its compulsory jurisdiction. Most countries, even India has acceded to the jurisdiction of the ICJ, but most countries have a what is called a carve out or exceptions to the declaration of compulsory jurisdiction. So countries, for example, may exclude from resolution of disputes. They may exclude matters relating to defense, for example. They may be excluded from the compulsory jurisdiction. India and Pakistan both have a very interesting exception. Any dispute with a Commonwealth country is left out of India's acceptance of jurisdiction of the ICJ. So if there is any direct dispute between India and Pakistan, it can never be taken to the ICJ because it will be a dispute between two countries which were at one time part of the Commonwealth. There is a second kind of jurisdiction, and that is a specific jurisdiction created in treaties. The two examples I can give you straight away, and in which India was involved, are the aviation treaties, where countries have agreed to overflight of civilian, civilian aircrafts. And any disputes arising out of the aviation treaties goes to the International Court of Justice. The second is the Vienna Convention for Consular Relations, for example. That has a separate protocol which all, all the countries who are parties to, almost all the countries who are parties to the Vienna Convention have signed. And th that treaty itself says if there is a dispute as to the interpretation of this treaty, it goes to the International Court of Justice. So those are called treaty jurisdictions. And the third, of course, is what is called a special agreement. So many times disputes between countries, countries may agree that all right, this dispute can be referred to the ICJ and the ICJ's decision will be accepted as binding by both sovereign nations. It is an international court. It works like an international institution, almost like a diplomatic institution. The modality of the court is very interesting. You first file a memorial. Memorial must contain all the allegations of fact and law and any evidence you want to give. The country against whom the dispute has been raised the defendant or the respondent, as we may call it, will file its own reply memorial. Then you get a chance to file your rejoinder, and then you get a reply to the rejoinder. So there are four sets of pleadings which are filed. This is the detailed written material. Then comes oral submissions. After seeing this, the court fixes time for oral submissions. 
and they are fairly strict with the allocation of time and the court decides how much time a case will need so they may give you one and a half hours for the opening as in our in Kulbushan Jadav's case they realized it shouldn't take too long so they gave what are not 90 minutes for the opening submissions <clears throat> and they gave uh, I think one hour for the closing submissions or two hours for the opening submissions. so they fixed the time and equality of time is in short so we went in first in the opening starting at 10 and I think we finished at I think we had three hours for the opening so we started at 10 we finished at 1 the other side got the next morning opening 10 to 1 then we got 24 hours from that time so the third day at 2 o'clock we got a hearing so we were our hearing was 2 to 3 30 and the fourth day, the other side got the hearing at 3.30. So they were given full 20 hours from the closing of our hearing to give their presentation. So this is how the court worked. Oral submissions have to be first written down and given in writing. So it's a very unique experience of giving a written oral submission. You give a written speech, as it were, or a written opening submission, and you have to give it at least one and a half hours before the opening of the court. And that is because the reason is there are so many judges, many of them don't speak English as their first language. So it's translated into multiple languages. The court is bilingual. The court's proceedings can either be in French or in English. And there's, of course, simultaneous translation. So you can wear a headphone and get it translated into whatever language you want to hear the proceedings in. So one of the challenges, if one may say so in a lighter way, and one of the challenges is when you're reading your speech, how do you keep 15 judges awake? Because if you're just going to, in a boring, monotonous voice, read out your speech, then the judges will go to sleep. And you have to be very careful because you, if they give you time of 90 minutes you have to stop at the 90th minute the filing is done through civil servant so normally a civil servant is appointed as the agent and the filing is done in the name of the civil servant because it's like a diplomatic court like a diplomatic institution and then it is the civil servant who normally opens the hearing and says I appear for my country and this is what we want and then he hands, then he says, I will invite my lawyer to address you. And then the court, the president of the court invites you to address the court. Judges don't ask questions. They are supposed to write down their questions, if any, which come into their mind and give them to the president, who after the close, closing of submissions puts those questions to you. I don't think I've ever been asked a question. I've done three cases now. I've never been asked a question. Very rare is it that a question is asked by any other judges. So that's how the court works. So what happened in Kulbushan Jadav's case? Kulbushan Jadav is an ex-Navy commander. And his case is that he carries on business in Iran one day he was kidnapped and handed over by the Taliban to the Pakistan army. The fact that he was seized by the Pakistan army at the Pakistani border with Iran is admitted. Of course, Pakistan does not admit that he was kidnapped by the Taliban. There is no clarity. There has been no clarity in Pakistan's case as to how they nabbed him. Their case generally is that he they caught him trying to infiltrate Pakistan at the Pakistan-Iran border. It's a place called Chabar or something. And that's where they caught him. And curiously, they claim while he was trying to infiltrate, 
he was also carrying a passport with him which was in some name some muslim gentleman's name and had his photograph and they claim it's a passport issued by india india of course denies it and therefore that is how he was arrested it is admitted by them that he was taken by the army he was kept in army lockup pakistan they have amended the army act this has been the criticism of a lot of countries pakistan they have amended the army act to provide for a trial of even civilians by army courts so there are certain offenses like terrorism and other related offenses where you are tried by the army courts so he was arrested and the army procedure was followed and they admit that it was he was kept in the army custody and he made it according to them he gave a confession and before even they informed india of his arrest they made this confession global his confession makes interesting reading it is a very general kind of a confession saying that i've been a bad boy i have indulged in terrorist activities in this place and that place and on behalf of india i've done a lot of bad things in pakistan no details no dates no incidents mentioned no specific incidents mentioned and they claim that on the basis of this he was then sent to trial he was given a army officer as a lawyer to represent him they claim he was tried it was much later that they informed india a few weeks after his arrest they informed india that they have arrested him now this is interesting in the context of the vienna convention the vienna convention principally was to formalize in the form of a treaty the general conventions which had come to govern the conduct of sovereign states in relation to consular officers over decades in fact one could say over maybe even a century plus it has always been accepted that consular officers are accorded privileges and of the functions of a consulate in a foreign country the phrases used are sending country and host country in the consulate office in a host country the consular officer of a sending country one of his jobs is to assist nationals of the sending country if they have any problems including if they are involved in legal proceedings criminal proceedings in the host country so the vienna council uh, the vienna convention of consular relations we call it vc the vc provide that soon after arrest as is reasonably possible you will inform the consulate of the country to which the national belongs if he is not a local national and that consulate will have that consulate officer will have to be allowed access to the person whom you have arrested the idea is that the consulate officer can therefore ensure the well being of the person who is in detention and he can also help arrange for legal assistance to the person who is being charged of a crime in the what is called the host country the way the convention is worded it's very interesting the international court of justice has said that on the language of the convention it is clear that this right of consular access is a twin right it is a right which vests in the person who is under detention and it's a right which also vests in the sovereign country and therefore in the consulate officer so one could say india also has a right it's not just that kulbushan had the right to be 
contacted by and assisted by an Indian consulate officer. Even India and the Indian consulate officer had a right to contact Kulbushan and to assist him. Assist him. That's the construction of the treaty which is accepted. Despite this, Pakistan refused to allow, first of all, they usually delayed consular access. Well, they usually delayed informing uh, the uh, Indian consulate about his arrest. The moment Indian consulate was informed that an Indian citizen has been arrested, they, as a formality, they immediately, as a, as a natural consequence, requested the uh, Pakistan authorities to allow consular access. For over a year, the Pakistan authorities refused to allow consular access. Somewhere along the way, they came up with this theory that based on his confession, they have registered an FIR of offenses committed against Pakistan in India. And therefore, they should be allowed to investigate those offenses. And, and it made very interesting reading. So there was a jumbled up general confession which purportedly was made by Kulbushan Yadav. No specific incidents, just a general suggestion saying, I have done this in so and so place, and we've done that in so and so place, and I have been acting at the behest. And everybody was named from the from the intelligence chief to the home minister to everybody, and everybody was sort of named and said, These are all the people uh, at whose behest I've been acting. And Pakistan promptly registered an FIR of conspiracy against all senior functionaries in India and very sweetly told India, You allow us to investigate in India. I mean, it was a very plain attempt to try and build a counter narrative against India. India has always complained that Pakistan doesn't allow access and investigation into terrorists who are involved in heinous acts of terrorism in India. And the fact that these terrorists live in Pakistan is not in dispute. Your, the hijacker has been shown on TV so many times. The uh, fact that uh, the 26-11 incident was by Pakistani terrorists is not in dispute. Pakistan may, of course, like to live in denial, but I don't think anybody disputes that. So to try and build a counter-narrative, they, <clears throat> they registered an FR in which ev any and everybody who meant anything in India in the security apparatus was named and said, you allow us to investigate. And at one stage said, if you want consular access, we will consider after you allow investigation, something which a condition which you cannot impose. In the meanwhile, the army continued. They conducted what they call a trial. He was convicted and sentenced to death. At which point there was a serious concern in India that he will be sent to the gallows. The International Commission of Jurists in its reports has said where it has heavily criticized the military courts of Pakistan, they have said 95% of the people who are convicted by the military court are based are convicted on the basis of confessions. So anyway, Pakistan convicted him and it was, I think, May 2018 when an issue arose about his being executed because he had been convicted. There was no clarity whether they will allow him to file an appeal. And till that time, they had steadfastly refused to give consular access despite repeated, I think, I think 23 requests were made <clears throat> every two weeks, three weeks. We would make a request saying allow consular access. They used to refuse. Finally, when it came to the point that they would uh, likely, they were likely to execute him, that's when the government of India was extremely concerned. And that is when I was consulted by the Ministry of External Affairs. We looked up the Vienna Convention and I thought we could try making out a case. There were three precedents. Because I tried to see when is it that countries have had the courage to defy this convention. The answer was never before. There were three cases. 
those three cases came out of United States. And it's very interesting how those cases arise. The way those cases arise is that, as you know, in United States, there are people who have migrated from so many different countries. So somebody is arrested and there were two, two of those cases. One was Mexicans. The other was, uh, I think they were Germans. They were arrested and they were arrested by the local police. They were sent to trial. Now, there are a lot of Mexicans who are American citizens. There are a lot of Germans who are American citizens. So they were sent to trial and they were convicted of serious offenses. Some, someone was dec one was armed robbery and stuff like that. They were it, it was regular, the regular offenses, not terrorism or anything. And after their conviction, it transpired that there had, it had been in the violation of the Vienna Convention. So in one case, Mexico, in the other case, Federal Republic of Germany took America to the International Court. The International Court rejected all arguments raised by America about waiver, etc., and said it's a right. You cannot waive this right. It's a right in the country and it's a right in the national. And the fact that you did not know that he was a national of that country is neither here nor there. The moment it is established he was a national or if the claim is made and if it is found he's a national and you haven't given, you have violated the treaty. And the question then came of what relief could be given. So the court made it clear we don't sit and examine it on merits as an appeal court. If the trial has been in violation of the treaty, you must have what is called review and reconsideration. Now, that became a very serious problem in America because, as you know, in America, there is a very strong federal system. The conviction of these people was by the state courts because they had committed local offenses which were punishable under law. After the judgment of the ICJ saying review and reconsideration, the US president directed the states to reconsider and to create a mechanism for review. The state said, this is state law, you cannot compel us. And the president of the US cannot interfere in a trial in a state. And then it was challenged by the states in the US Supreme Court. And the US Supreme Court said, sorry, you cannot interfere with states. So with the result, those judgments have still not effectively been carried out. But fortunately, two of the people who were to be executed, I think the state itself agreed to treat them to uh, commute their sentence to an imprisonment. And that's how the matter got worked out. Those are the two. Those are the precedents we were relying upon. And we found that there was not a single case in which Pakistan had, uh, in which a country had brazenly said, we will not follow the Vienna Convention. Pakistan could not have possibly argued, although they tried, could not possibly have sensibly argued that they did not know he was an Indian national, considering the moment they got his confession, they started calling him Commander Jadav. And they told the whole global community he is an intelligence officer who is in, employed in India and is doing terrorist acts in Pakistan. Now, if that is the allegation you are making, you can't be heard to say, but I didn't know he was a citizen of India. I mean, make up your mind. You either know he's a citizen of India and you accuse him being an Indian of doing bad things in Pakistan, or you don't know he's an Indian. You chose to accuse him of being an Indian who was doing bad things in Pakistan. So at least that was established. So automatically you had to give consular access. So on that basis, we filed our case initially in May 18. We applied for an interim, what in Indian language would be called interim stay. And the court makes, uh, they, they call it uh, provision for uh, interim uh, relief and they measures, inter, uh, provisional measures, they say, call it an order for provisional measures. So they passed an order for provisional measures. They asked Pakistan, do you make a statement? You will not execute him, then we will do, don't need to do anything. Pakistan refused. So the president passed an order of uh, provisional measures and quickly convened a hearing in 2018. Now, this is where I say is remarkable because today India's stature in the global community is such that I think it was within a matter of two weeks that we managed to get a hearing in the ICJ for putting in place provisional measures. 
the matter was heard for the day. <clears throat> Pakistan tried its theatrics. Their lawyer tried. He brought a PowerPoint presentation and slides. Nothing to do with the case. He brought slides of his passport and this, and he wanted his uh, confession to be played in the court. And he was politely told this is not a place for theatrics. So we have nothing to do with this. The only question before the court is, have you allowed counselor access? If you haven't allowed, the case has to be heard. In the meanwhile, you cannot put him to death. On that basis, we got provisional measures and we got a final hearing date of February 2020, February 2019. In February 2019, the case was heard finally. And Pakistan, of course, raised all sorts of defenses. They tried to bring in the defense of his being, his holding an in, allegedly holding an Indian passport, and then that passport was in a false name. And they tried to say India has not answered. They tried to say India has not cooperated in that investigation under their FIR, in which they everybody in our security apparatus, according to them, was guilty. Those are the kind of defenses. They raised a very interesting defense. <clears throat> they said he was a spy. And the Vienna Convention does not apply to spies. From India's point of view, our biggest concern was we felt that if it if the only relief we get is review and reconsideration, then it may not fully it may not help because Pakistan is not going to really do anything which will give us any relief. So we pitched our case. I we. For relief, we said one option was either release him, which we knew was a long shot, or we brought a case saying I bring in place a position consistent with due process. And that has been, I think, our biggest success. The case was heard. The one of the points which I had raised was that the Vienna Convention is of 60s, but after that, we have the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And today, human rights are an accepted norm. So today, fair trial, trial which is unbiased, trial by a court which is fair, are considered to be integral parts of human rights law, are integral parts of due process. And what is called basic or minimum due process is a recognized element of public international law. So we tied all that up and tried to say, therefore, you must inspire your construction of the Vienna Convention. You must be inspired by human rights as they are understood today and by the covenant on civil and political rights. The reason why we could not go further was, as I explained to you, the jurisdiction between India and Pakistan generally is barred because we are both Commonwealth nations. So the compulsory jurisdiction under which we could have gone against breach by Pakistan of basic human rights is not available to a dispute between India and Pakistan. So we had to keep our dispute within the Vienna Convention. That is the limitation which we were stuck with. Anyway, we managed to persuade the court to go at least this far, that they said, while we cannot enforce the ICCPR and these limited proceedings, the interpretation of the Vienna Convention must be imbued with the principles of human rights and the general value system, which has now come into being. And on that basis, the court rejected Pakistan's arguments that domestic law in Pakistan provides adequately for review and reconsideration. And they have said you have to have effective review and reconsideration, including, if necessary, by amending your law. Now, that's a relief they did not give in America cases. <coughs> that is where we are. After which, of course, Pakistan has given consular access, but it's too late. And we have now been in a tussle with Pakistan, trying to get them to set up a machinery. Pakistan believes, first of all, they told the whole world they had won the case. Good for them. And now they keep saying that you have to 
file a proceeding in a Pakistani court or take Pakistani proceedings, we keep saying, how do you propose to carry out the judgment of the ICJ and give effective review and reconsideration? They refuse to answer that question. So we have had exchanges backward and forward. I think government of India has been writing to them. And who knows the way things are going, we may have to be back in the ICJ someday, trying to get justice for Jamal But we've at least brought it this far. They cannot put him to death. They are now concerned that our consular officers have to be given access now and then. So they have to keep him in a good condition. And they have to, I think they also must be seeing the fact that they can avoid this problem for a while but someday India will insist and the point which India has taken is an effective review must correct the breach of the convention the convention required consular access right at the beginning upon his arrest he should have been given consular access before his confession was recorded and if you fail to do so that confession has to be disregarded if they disregard his confession, there will be no evidence left. And this is, I will close by telling you this. In my reply arguments, I said they keep talking about his having a passport. Let us assume, for argument's sake, while we deny it strongly, let us assume that he was carrying a false passport. Surely he's not been put to death for carrying a false passport. What has he been put to death for? Pakistan to date has refused to make a will. If we have written letters from India saying we have to arrange for a legal representation, do you mind giving us his charge sheet? Because the CRPC, old CRPC we have in India, the 1898, that continues to apply in Pakistan. Evidence Act continues to apply in Pakistan. So we said, can you have please the FIR, the charge sheet, and the judgment of the military court? And you say he filed an appeal and the appeal is dismissed, the judgment of the military appeal court. Can you please give us those? They refuse to give that. The <clears throat> confession doesn't show any single offense. It talks of multiple offenses without any particulars in different places, or oh, this incident and that incident. So I told the International Court of Justice that we share the same uh, CRPC. And for each, if, if a one man has committed five acts of terrorism, you have to have five trials. It has to be five separate offenses, five separate transactions. These are not connected transactions. Over a period of three years, if you've indulged in five acts of terrorism, you have to have five trials. Where are the FIRs? Where are the charge sheets? Where is the evidence? Pakistan refuses to show that. Now we've been writing to Pakistan saying, can you show us the evidence against him so that we can assist him in preparing his defense? They refuse to part with it. They said, we will not give it to you. So I think they have a serious problem in their hands. Other than the confession, they have nothing. Their domestic, what I call their uh, banana courts of their military may find that sufficient and they have convicted him. They know if it comes for a fair consideration and a fair trial, they will have no choice but to release him. And that will be a big loss of face. So that is how we have managed to get some justice so far for Jadav, someday we shall have him back in India. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for taking us through the journey, sir, at the International Court of Justice. Now, sir, we are getting certain questions also, sir, and I would like to post it to you, sir, if you can. Sure. Thank you so much. Sir. So the first question I'm getting is, what were the challenges faced by you in the Kulbushan case, as in, sir, about the logistics or about how, how it happened. I must say, I must say, there were no challenges. In the sense, normally, you know, all of us who've done work for government, it is such a problem. But here, God bless her soul, Shushmaji called me and she said, uh, I, on a TV interview, I had maybe said, you know, this is ridiculous and India should go to ICJ. She called me and said, Kalbade Zor se bol rathe na, TV mein ICJ jana hai, jao. <laughs> so I said, Nee, Jarur Jayenge. She said, This is the case. I'm sending them to you. Her uh, joint secretary came directly. The biggest one challenge which we had is everything we do, Pakistan gets to know, and everything they do, we get to know. We were scared if they get to know we are going to ICJ and applying for a stay, they might execute him promptly and say, Sorry, it's all over, done, and dusted. 
So I, between my junior and I, we wrote out the complaint. It was done on a pen drive. And we used to do it at a time when we used to disconnect our computers from um, the internet. That pen drive used to go to the government. Uh, the, the Joint Secretary used to take it. He showed from that pen drive, he showed his secretary whatever changes they had to make came back on that very pen drive to me. We made a final draft. A copy was printed, shown to Shushmaji. She read it, and in our presence, it was put in the shredder. And she personally went to the prime minister, told him this is what we are doing. He said, go right ahead. And we were in court. That was one hurdle. The other was trying to get it listed. And um, being an Indian senior counsel, I said, not my job. <laughs> get it listed. I'll come. She said, nothing doing. You have to go and get it listed. So <laughs> I went to the ICJ. And just as well, I went because the registrar, he was very warm. But you have to, I had to explain to him what the case was about and why we needed an urgent listing. So it was like a five-minute argument before him telling him he's, what the case was, why we had come, what was our concerns. And then he said, OK, I will pass this on to the president of the court. And that's how we got it listed. So what are our major uh, limitations? The third major limitation is you don't have a decent hotel in The Hague. <laughs> so, I mean, the hotels there are pretty uh, OK, nothing great. So I need a hotel with a gym. None, none of the hotels have good gyms. So. Right, sir. Other than sir. that, there was no problem. Sir. So the next question, sir, comes, sir, when it is asked, it's been a while since the verdict at the International Court of Justice has been pronounced, but nothing has been heard of Kulbushan Jadav of late. What do you think is the current situation of Jadav there, sir, in case in Yeah, in we have sense, been. Uh, I, I know what the current situation is. We have had seven or eight exchanges. Yeah. And uh, there was a, we were hoping that through back channels, we may be able to persuade Pakistan to let him go. If they want to say on humanitarian grounds or whatever, we want him back. We said, let him go. Because it's become a big ego problem in Pakistan. So we were hoping they would let him go. They haven't. We have written four or five letters. They just keep denying. and. Uh, letter came as recently when I was last in Delhi. I met the Honorable Minister, Mr. Jai Krishna, who's been there as first dealing with the case. First, he was secretary. When Shushmaji was the minister, then now he's become the minister. So I've been uh, working with all these people very closely. So I know what's going on. I think we've reached a point where we may have to now decide whether we want to go back back to the ICJ for further consequential directions, because Pakistan has just not moved ahead. Right, sir. Sir, there's an interesting question which has come. It says, it is also come to light that abusive language was used by the Council of Pakistan, on which you had strong objections. What was the reaction of the ICJ bench on it, sir? Um, I must tell you, the uh, he is a lawyer in London, a commercial court lawyer, Mr. Kavar Qureshi. He claims to have done a lot of cases in the ICJ. Of course, we could not find uh, any track record of his having done big cases. I was very grateful for, he obviously spent a lot of Pakistani money appointing a host of uh, professors in the King's College to do research. And we were very, very grateful to him for all the material he filed because all that he could find in support of his arguments were either dissenting judgments of judges. So we found the majority judgments in our favor, which either didn't decide the issue or decided it in our favor. He also got the original, what is called the Trava Prapatuar, the, the preparatory papers of the treaty, which showed that there had been an issue raised about spies being excluded, and it was expressly rejected in this said you can't exclude spies from the treaty. We didn't have access to those papers. He produced them. He, I don't know why he wanted to rely on them. But anyway, he produced. We are very grateful to him. But he tried something very funny, very unfortunate. As I told you, the pleadings there are filed not through lawyers, but they are filed because it's like countries. It's like sovereign. It's like a diplomatic institution where foreign countries go and appear before them. So it is our 
pleading was filed was signed by the agent and the agent is your civil servant. So Pakistan's agent was their attorney general. Our agent was Dr. Mittal, who is the joint secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs. And he signed the pleadings. Lawyer's name is not mentioned. No pleading ever mentioned settled by or drawn by. In fact, their judgments also never mentioned so and so argued. It always says India argued, Pakistan argued, America argued, Germany argued. They don't mention lawyer's names because it, it's a different kind of a institution. He had produced two expert reports. Now, one of the points which we had run is that you cannot allow going back for a review and reconsideration in the military court because military courts don't stand, don't uh, satisfy the minimum due process and for which we had find some material. So he had filed an expert's report saying military courts are there in the world. I mean, we all know military courts are there in the world. You don't need a military expert to say that. Completely irrelevant report. The second is he had filed a full expert report to say that it appeared that the passport which had been found appeared to have been issued by India. We said again that's a non-issue because are you going to try them on merits? If you're going to try them on merits, bring all the facts. You can't bring one fact and try to prejudice people. You are concerned with whether the Vienna Convention was complied with or not. You are not concerned with whether the passport was right or wrong or what happened in the trial. So he, there were two expert reports here, and, and we, we were very dismissive in our uh, uh, in our memorial. And at one place, the person who had done the final typing, he quoted one paragraph at two places from the report. In the second place where he quoted, he missed one word. And Mr. Uh, two weeks before the hearing, Mr. Uh, Khawar Qureshi threatened me with taking me to the Bar Standards Board in Britain, because being a barrister, I'm subject to the Bar Standards Board, for false and misleading pleadings, including this one typo and my characterization that the expert report said what it re carefully read, it meant exactly opposite of what he was saying it means. So for that, he said, you're misleading the ICJ. So he sent me a threatening letter. I had already stopped going to chambers because I was preparing the case. So my head of chambers wrote back saying, uh, Mr. Salve is busy with the case. He'll deal with your letter la later on. But since it had come to me, I made it a point in my opening. I mentioned that since I'm being threatened with this and I'm the suggestion is I'm trying to mislead you. I want to show you these two paras. And this is the, my pleading is clear and these reports are irrelevant. So I made light of it. So he got very angry. So he used very strong language against India, saying that defense is dishonest and dishonest and disgusting and all sorts of uh, words, which you, even in a commercial court, you use very carefully. Leave alone. In the ICJ, they never use language like this. So I thought the best is in my reply, I said that I, you get the transcripts. In the transcript, I did a word check. And I said, I've done a word check and the word disgusting has appeared 14 times, dishonest has appeared eight times, and lying has appeared so many times. I said, I've done this. I said, this is not the language which is used in this court. I don't want to be guilty of the same offense. I said, I could have replied to him. But I said, I have two problems. One is, A, I have immense respect for this institution and I don't want to disgrace your portals by using such language. And I said, the second is, my Indian traditions prevent me from stooping to this level to make these kind of comments. Pakistan is our neighboring country. We may have our differences, but I don't I don't think using language like this in an international institution behoves an Indian. It may be different from Mr. Mr. Qureshi. <laughs> so third day there was a function and the registrar of the court met our ambassador and he said uh, you know we are there's so much heat in this case and he says, we've just finished the America-Iran sanctions case, which is far greater overtones. But he said, it's done so peacefully. This case, we don't know why it's getting all exciting. That is a polite way of saying, you know, what sort of language is being used in this case. But later on, we got to hear that a lot of judges felt that this is not. So in, when it came to his rejoinder, he was almost apologetic for the language he used. He said, I have not said it so many times, and I have not done this. He sort of just threw in the towel in his rejoinder. He, he didn't even take the full time given. He was given 45 minutes. I think in 20 minutes, he wound up and he sat down. 
that probably got the best out of it. <laughs> so there's a very, very long question which has come. So I'll try to read sir, slowly for you. In Avina and Right to Information on Counselor Assistance, both the International Court of Justice and Inter-American Court of Human Rights were concerned with the meaning of the expression in a situation where a detained national is not duly notified of his right to counselor notification. In Jadav, on the other hand, the ICJ was concerned with the expression without delay in a situation where the detained national has expressed his desire to have the counselor officers informed about his arrest and that is not done by the receiving states. Do you think the expression in the two situations mean differently or are they the same? Sir? Let me clarify. Uh, detained national being informed without unreasonable delay are two different are, are two different sequences. Detained national being informed is whether he is detained a in which case it was there was and the second is national and pakistan despite all that they were arguing also set up the plea that in any case india has failed to prove that uh, uh, jadav was an indian national so we said on your 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 entire memorial keeps saying commander jadav commander jadav of the indian navy and then you want us to prove he's an indian national i mean <laughs> what sort of a silly silly case case was this Unreasonable delay or reasonable delay was relevant in Avina, in, and they construed it. The question was, do you have to inform immediately, and what is reasonable delay? And for that, there was material to show that they deliberately said they were given reasonable time, because sometimes, if and especially in a spy situation, if you catch a spy of another country, and he may, you may find out, you may, may the other spies you may be wanting to catch. And if the moment you inform that country, we've got one spy, the others may go underground. So that's why reasonable time is allowed. What is reasonable would depend on the facts of the case. In our case, my argument was, which finally that's why they didn't have to decide that case. There was no question of reasonable time because Pakistan flatly refused till the end of the case to allow counselor access. So they took a firm position saying, we don't have to allow counselor access. And the only justification which came for the first time in their merits reply, for the first time they gave a justification, they said, since he's a spy, we don't have to give him counselor access. So that's how the expression, reasonable time did not really come up for construction in Jadav because there was a flat refusal to give. Right, sir. Right, sir. So there's one question which is slightly emotional also for us, which says, we are aware of what happened to Sarabjit inside the Pakistani jail. How can India ensure that Jadav does not meet the similar treatment, sir? This is basically the same. We, we, we well, are uh, the only way we can ensure is we have brought the spotlight on this case. We are keeping the spotlight on this case. We are keeping this under the glare of global communities. Watch of uh, you'll be uh, i don't know whether you have read that the president of the icj makes a presentation to the united nations every year about the working of the court and the important cases and he gave this judgment as one of the important cases decided by the court including a case in which they had taken the law forward by construing the vienna convention in the light of the Con uh, covenant of civil and political rights so we have kept the glare on this case in the hope that Pakistan, despite what it is, will not act worse than what it generally does. Right, sir. So the last question, sir, by all of, by all uh, all junior counsel, sir, what is your advice on practice of law to young advocates in India, sir? My advice is work hard. Focus. Don't chase money. Money will chase you once you get success. Try always when you're working. The, the, one, of, one of the things which has helped me a lot is, first of all, 
remember you're a salesman of ideas and the judge is your customer you have to sell your idea to the judge first of all don't come with, a, with an idea which is so outlandish that nobody is going to buy so try and fit your client's case within a reasonable enunciation of the law and the second is never take extreme positions always try and keep your case simple keep it short and keeping a case short requires a lot of hard work and that is the secret of good advocacy focus the devil lies in the detail keep your case simple and always remember there is a man sitting across and he is the one you have to convince however convinced you may feel is not going to help your client so behave in a way which is pleasant which makes your submissions attractive which make you attractive and that is the secret of good advocacy thank you sir so we'll try to follow that sir so now thank you for the insight and now sir i would like mr natiketa joshi sir general secretary adivakta parishad supreme court unit to thank you sir for sharing such valuable aspects of the case with us so can we have mr natiketa joshi please thank you thank you ardendu thank you so much uh, first of all foremost i would thank uh, harish salve sir for taking out time and energy for uh, for this function and for the series this was the concluding uh, series of ours and we wanted really that so would take it up and we were very happy that uh, on a very short notice via email we contacted sir and sir was gracious enough to accept our invitation thank you sir for remembering dattopan thengde ji he was a visionary which many of the present generations really don't know and therefore thank you so much for remembering him sir uh, it was really a pleasure and a privilege to hear you sir on this subject because most of the indian advocates as well as indians are not really aware of how the icj works and how the procedures are followed over there thank you sir for explaining in detail the procedures the jurisdictions of the international court of justice thank you sir for all also explaining the challenges that you faced and the legal contentions that were taken up from your side as well as from the other side and sir foremost uh, the the interesting part was the salesman of ideas that we as lawyers should be thank you so much for those words uh, we we really appreciate for your kind support and for encouraging the juniors uh, to to hear us thank you sir uh, i uh, as this is a concluding uh, session i would also thank the uh, organization as well because uh, this was a bunch of uh, young lawyers who had this idea within us that we would be trying something of uh, the sort and uh, within a couple of days we framed Uh, outer outer this thing uh, as to how would we uh, be going about it we we contacted people and we finally had so many senior advocates and jurists who came up and who spoke over the last two weeks there were 12 sessions in total which took place this all happened because uh, the seniors out there in our organization supported us encouraged us and motivated us to take up this new challenge because in times of covid uh, it really is difficult as to how a person would cope up especially for lawyers who are litigating lawyers and who have no other work except for urgent matters so we we thought that this idea of having the entire lecture series and having all senior advocates uh, before you uh, as the subscribers would uh, certainly help all the viewers uh, with the legal uh, uh, various subjects which were taken up uh sir uh, at the end sir i would like to quote your uh, few words uh, we we are requesting as an organization that everyone should contribute to the pm cares fund and uh, so three beautiful lines by uh, shri hari salve would really encourage us uh, i've taken it from his book and he says i feel everybody doesn't have to grow a forest to contribute to the environment if you grow enough in your own little patch you will be contributing something so so touchy words sir so appropriate words in the present time and therefore i request all my karyakartas who are there with the organization and who are also indians 
to contribute to the PM Cares Fund. Whatever minimum amount we can contribute, we should contribute because these are times tough for uh, many of them. We are lucky enough that we are sitting in our houses and we are able to hear these lectures on Wi-Fi. But uh, there are many people out there on streets who are striving for food and therefore we should make an effort that we contribute towards the PM Care Fund. We should ensure that everyone should at least touch upon 100 people so that we can add the overall, ensure that we have a good collection and a contribution towards this fund. I would also request everyone to kindly download the Arogya Setu app because that is going to be the next thing as far as this COVID fight is concerned, this will only ensure that we are not getting in touch in close with any person who's already affected. It will keep us protected and safe. And therefore, everyone should uh, download this app. With this, all the followers who have been following us for the last two weeks, we thank all of them who have been continuously watching, sir, because uh, it, has no, it, it would have been difficult without uh, the comments which have been coming in, the interesting likes, uh, posts which have been made, uh, that we would not have been encouraged to continue with the whole thing. In fact, there has been so, en so much of encouragement that we have thought that we would be coming up with the next uh, lecture series again. And the next lecture series we ha uh, has been named after Madhav Menonji, and it would be the Madhav Menon lecture series. Uh, on, uh, interestingly, on the 8th of May, it is his first death anniversary. And on that day, we, we, we are intending to launch the next series. So everyone, please keep commenting on the, uh, the post and keep uh, giving your suggestions so that we can come out with better and better ideas and bring about more speakers on this lecture series. Thanking you, everyone. Back to Ardindu. Thank you, Nachiketa ji. So I once again thank you on behalf of the Akhil Bharti Adivakta Parishad and myself, sir, for taking a time out today for us and take us through your journey, sir. I also thank all the viewers. Please do like and subscribe to our channel, which gives us strength and encouragement to host such sessions. Please stay safe and follow the government guidelines on prevention of Corona. Stay home, stay safe. Namaskar. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thanks.